the Detroit River, a narrow waterway that separates Detroit, Michigan, and Windsor, Canada, in some places by less than a mile. Peaceful today, these waters were once turbulent. During Prohibition, this is the epicenter for illegal alcohol in America. It is known as the Detroit-Windsor Funnel, an estimated 75% of all the liquor smuggled during Prohibition comes across this waterway. Detroit was a wild, wild town in the 20s. The illegal liquor business here in 1925 was conservatively estimated to be a $250 million a year business, employing 50,000 people. No other place in, 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 the, in the United States offered this opportunity with the availability of liquor on the one side and the market on the other side. Canada has its own dry law, but when the United States passes the 18th Amendment, they see an economic opportunity. So Canada modifies their law and legalizes the production of alcohol for exportation only. The Canadian government looked at it this way. We'll license all of these distilleries and breweries. It'll employ thousands of people and give them jobs. We'll uh, add a tax on for every quart produced, and we'll make a large amount of money uh, as a result of it. In Ontario alone, 29 breweries and 16 distilleries begin producing alcohol for export. Many are located near or on the Detroit River. The Windsor side of the river was lined with export docks, so you went over there in a rowboat and said, I'd like to get 50 cases of uh, Canadian Club. So they give you the 50 cases and they say, where's your destination? You'd say Cuba. When you left the dock, nobody cared where you went. Boats deliver a constant stream of liquor to Detroit. In the winter, a frozen river makes it even easier to get to Canada. People did all kinds of things. They bought $5 jalopies, Model Ts, and they took the doors off the side and they ran them across in areas where the Detroit River used to freeze over. Some of these people would even carry 12-foot or 15-foot planks, if you can imagine, and actually try to drive the car from one ice floe to another. It was just a completely insane atmosphere. People would do anything to try and get booze over here. Automobiles were redesigned, rebuilt, so there were places now to store liquor. Trucks were, had uh, separate compartments underneath the, the cartage area. Sometimes they would use a hearse. It came to the uh, attention of U.S. Customs once. Why are the Canadians coming over here to get buried? And uh, finally, the Customs agents checked and discovered that indeed there was a casket in the hearse, but uh, the casket was not with the deceased, but laden with uh, very expensive Scotch whiskey. The passenger ferry crossing the Detroit River provides ample opportunity for everybody to get into the smuggling game. This is Nell Rhodes. In 1931, she modeled the fine art of smuggling liquor in hot water bottles for the Detroit Times. They were filled with alcohol and placed uh, like suspenders across the shoulders and down the back underneath her coat, usually women. And after making several trips, they made quite a bit of money by bootlegging that way it was on an individual basis. The average annual salary in the 1920s is less than $2,000 a year. Many rum runners could make that much in two weeks. But this is nothing compared to what big time bootleggers bring in. George Remus, a lawyer turned bootlegger, is reported to have made over $80 million during the first two years of prohibition alone. Joseph Kennedy is believed to have made much of his fortune exporting alcohol from Canada during Prohibition, financing a dynasty that culminates with his son's election to the White House. But possibly nobody benefits more from Prohibition than the gangster.
One of the terrible consequences of prohibition was that it really bankrolled organized crime in this country. It took a lot of basically pickpockets, two big thugs out the street, and made multi-millionaires out of them. It is blood money that lines the mobsters' pockets, spilled by thousands who suffer grim and untimely deaths at the hands of men like Dutch Schultz, Bugsy Siegel, and Al Capone. But the violence of these notorious thugs is rivaled and often surpassed by a group of young Jewish gangsters who ruled Detroit's underworld. They are the Purple Gang. The Purple Gang was a very violent, high-profile group of mobsters that basically were very heavy on muscle and very light on brains. They were totally, completely ruthless. The Purple Gang is led by the Bernstein brothers, the sons of honest, hard-working immigrants who came to America in search of a better life. But the Bernstein boys have other ideas of how the American dream should be attained. The Purples did not make their reputation as rum runners. They made their reputation as hijackers and strong arm men. If they were out to kill somebody, they'd walk into a crowded restaurant or a crowded theater or wherever and find the person that they were looking for and shoot them. And maybe shoot two or three other people in the process that just happened to get into the way. They literally had the public in the city of Detroit terrorized. Between 1925 and 1932, over 500 murders go unsolved in Detroit. Most are attributed to the Purple Gang. From hijacking liquor, the Purples extend their violent reach and muscle in on Detroit's speakeasy business. Seize control of the illegal distilleries and distribution throughout the city and take over the river and control the movement of alcohol from Canada. In 1927, at the height of the Purple Gang's power, over a half million cases of liquor are smuggled across the Detroit River. Typically what they would do is when they would get a bottle of Canadian liquor, they would cut it. They'd make three or four bottles out of it. And uh, there were cutting plants all over the city. It was just, just a process of watering down the alcohol, adding coloring to it, adding a few other different types of chemicals to make it look like the real thing, and then putting tickets on it, which were false labels. The Purple Gang distributes their liquor to gangsters throughout the entire country. One of their customers is none other than public enemy number one, Alphonse Scarface Capone. A Brooklyn, New York native, Capone heads west in 1921. He quickly takes over the illegal liquor trade in Chicago and rules the town with a combination of brutal savagery and shrewd marketing. Next, Capone sets his sights on Detroit. Capone was a very astute businessman. And in 1927, he came to Detroit with the idea of opening up a franchise. And he sat down and had a meeting with the four Bernstein brothers, and they essentially told him that river belongs to us. Anything that moves across that river, you either deal with us, or you just don't have any business in Detroit. So Capone realized that a gang war with the Purples here in Detroit was a losing proposition. Capone aligns himself with the Purples, and together they take bootlegging and violence to a new level. Their brutality culminates in one of the bloodiest slaughters in Prohibition history. Bugs Moran, leader of the rival Northside gang in Chicago, hijacks a load of Purple Gang whiskey intended for Capone. Seeking revenge, Capone orchestrates a trap. Supposedly, a freelance hijacker had called Moran and told him he had a really bargain basement uh, uh, shipment of liquor for him. Well, Moran, who, could not, uh, who, who couldn't turn down a good deal, said, OK. Supposedly, Abe Bernstein, the reputed leader of the Purple Gang, had made that phone call. The trap is set. The bogus shipment of liquor is to be delivered to Moran at a warehouse in Chicago on February 14th, 1929. When the Northside gang arrives, 
purple gangsters hidden across the street call in the hitmen. Disguised as police, the killers enter the warehouse pretending to raid. As they line the north side gangsters against the wall, two additional hitmen enter the warehouse with Thompson submachine guns and open fire. It will go down in history as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Although it is well known that Capone orchestrated the slaughter, few know that the Purple Gang was directly involved. The Purple Gang was really never implicated in it. Three Purple Gangsters were positively identified, but nothing was ever done. It just kind of faded into oblivion. Ironically, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre misses the intended target. Bugs Moran is late to the meeting and narrowly avoids his death sentence. Still, the carnage sends shockwaves through the country, a painful reminder of the violence and lawlessness created by the 18th Amendment. During Prohibition, organized crime groups like the Purple Gang helped drive up the homicide rate by nearly 80%. The number of federal convicts rises by over 500%. The country was fed up of prohibition. Gangsters were taking over cities. Gangsters were taking over police forces. There was far more violence in the streets. It obviously wasn't working. Soon, many of the staunchest moral crusaders realize prohibition has backfired. The 18th Amendment has delivered this nation bound hand and foot to organized crime. We believe that the 18th Amendment has failed, and failed badly. I'm a reformed prohibitionist myself. I hoped it was going to work. I'm forced to admit that it has not. Well-intended people who felt that prohibition would bring a new moral tone to America created the very problem that they were trying to suppress or eliminate. In 1933, President Roosevelt signs the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, repealing prohibition and ending the 13-year drought. But illegal liquor in America will not disappear. A combination of local dry laws and the return of taxes provide the fuel that keeps white lightning flowing. By the light of the moon,